Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You may regret that applause when you hear what I'm going to talk to you about. How many of you think you could sit through a lecture about biochemistry and enjoy it? But that's what I'm going to ask you to do is sit through a whole lecture about biochemistry. That's going to take some of you back to high school, others of you back to junior high, some of you a place you've never been before. But it's very important that you understand the biochemistry of the molecules of life. Let's talk about the molecules of life. The most basic molecule of all is water. They say you're made of about 70-80% water. Now I want you to look at this structure carefully because you need to understand how we represent molecules in terms of chemical drawings. And they're very simple, but you have to do a little bit of memory as we go along. What I want you to do is look at the molecule of water, H2O. You see that the hydrogens are in gray and the oxygen is in red. So there's the most basic molecule, all of life. One of the most important molecules is sugars. You hear all kinds of things about sugar. You hear that sugar is something terrible. You hear that carbohydrate is terrible. But actually, sugar is the basic molecule for, for life in terms of energy, as well as doing many structural things in your body. You can't live in good health without having sugar in your diet. Now, these carbohydrates or sugars, they come by various terms. We call them sugars or simple sugars. We call them carbohydrates. We call them complex carbohydrates. And we also use the term dietary fiber. But one of the most important terms for you to get familiar with is the term starch. Now, starch sounds like a terrible thing, doesn't it? Something you do your laundry with, something really sticky and gooey. You never want it inside your body. But actually, the correct term for the kinds of foods that I want you to eat is starch. Starchy foods are potatoes and sweet potatoes and corn and beans and potatoes. They're also referred to, not correctly, but they're also referred to as complex carbohydrates. But actually the proper scientific term is starch. So let's talk about sugars and see how we can learn about them and how important they are in your body. The most basic of all sugars is glucose. Glucose is the form of sugar that enters your cells, that powers the machinery. You notice this is a ring structure and in addition to the gray hydrogen and the red oxygen, you also have a green atom there and that is carbon. carbon, right, carbon, green, makes sense, carbon. The molecule, another very basic molecule with life, you can think of carbon in terms of plants. Well this is the most basic of all sugars and of course because it is a simple sugar, we call it Glucose is simple sugar. Now you can take two simple sugars, two different simple sugars and put them together. We still call those simple sugars. How about this one? How about table sugar or white sugar? Also called sucrose. That's a combination of glucose and fructose. Now fructose is a very important sugar for you to know about. You may have heard fructose in many different settings. You may have heard of high fructose corn syrup. You may have heard of fructose being in fruits. You may have heard that fructose is so good for you because it is the sugar that raises the glycemic index the least. In other words, causes your blood sugar to go up so little. And some people teach fructose as a healthy sugar. So we find fructose in uh, soda pops, for example. We find sucrose, which has half a molecule as fructose in all kinds of prepared and packaged foods. But there are some very important things for you to know about fructose. Paralleling the rise of obesity in this country is the rise in fructose consumption. Estimates are that it has gone up a thousand percent between 1970 and 1990. And there are many people who believe that fructose is really at the root of the epidemic of obesity in our country. Fructose doesn't act like usual sugars. As you're going to learn about in a few minutes, sugar generally is well tolerated by the body, but fructose doesn't act that way. It acts more like fat and it's an effect on hormones in the body and also the way that it causes the body to respond to foods. Fructose increases hunger, it increases your fat and food intake, and it does not stimulate satiety, satisfaction like you get from glucose. Plus, Fructose leads to the production of fat called de novo lipogenesis. I know this is a new term to you now, but as this discussion goes on, you will understand de novo lipogenesis. In other words, the production of fat from sugar. You hear all the time, 
don't eat sugar, turns to fat. Well, what they should say is don't eat fructose, which is present in so many manufactured products because that can easily turn into fat. Fructose causes elevation of your cholesterol and triglycerides more than any other sugar does. And I run into a lot of people who say, oh, I follow the McDougal diet carefully. I don't eat any more fat, I don't eat any more animal products, but what they're eating is a whole lot of white sugar, table sugar, and drinking a lot of sodas with fructose in them. And as a consequence, their triglycerides go up and often their cholesterol goes up also. So those of you who are worried about heart disease, any kind of artery disease, any kind of atherosclerosis or clogging of the arteries, not only do you have to be concerned about the cholesterol and the fat in your diet, but you also have to make sure you minimize the sugar in your diet, the simple sugars, and in particular, the fructose in your diet. And that may mean even for some of you, as I mentioned, fructose is in fruit. Some of you will have to limit your intake of fruit in your diet. For people who have high triglycerides, people who are worried about heart disease, one of the instructions that I give them is to keep their fruit to a minimum. And that may mean no fruit at all. Because if you start eating a, quote, healthier plant-based diet, one of the easiest things for you to be attracted to is fruit. Fruit's so easy, it's so enjoyable. I can sit and eat 20 fruits in the time that we're talking. I can eat 1,000 to 2,000 calories in fruit without even thinking about it. And that's a lot of fructose, which is a lot of calories, which by the way in the fruit is in a relatively healthy form. But those of you who are trying to lower your triglycerides, fructose and fruit's not going to help and it may even make it harder for you to lose weight. When you take and you attach a whole bunch of sugars together, you get chains of sugar. Actually, they're branching chains. And these branching chains of sugar, they can be they can be termed three different things. They can be termed starch, which is the substance that we're looking for. You may again think of that as complex carbohydrate. It can be dietary fiber and it can also be glycogen. Depending upon how it was made and how it's put together, you will get branching chains of sugar by three different forms and three different terms. Now you've probably heard about glycogen. Glycogen is the kind of sugar that people store in their muscles and in their liver. It's the kind of sugar that athletes use when they run the long race. You store about two pounds of glycogen invisibly in your liver and in your muscles when you eat a high carbohydrate diet and that provides the sugar you need later on when say you don't eat. So glycogen is very important. It's the body making chains of sugar itself after you eat. Now the other two kinds of branching chains of sugar are called starches and dietary fiber. And starches and dietary fiber are only made by plants. It's only plants that make starch and only plants that make fiber and it's very important that you remember that. Now there is a difference between starch and fiber, a very important difference. When you eat a plant food which contains both starch and dietary fiber, in your body, in your intestinal tract, you have enzymes that take and break the chains of sugar. If it is a starch, what happens is those enzymes get in there between the sugars and break them up and take and convert those chains, those branching chains of sugars into simple sugars which now go through your intestinal tract, into your bloodstream, into your cells and supply energy. When it comes to dietary fiber, dietary fiber again which is made by plants, it has the same sugars which are linked together by linkages, by connections that you do not have the enzymes to break down. And so as a result, because you don't have enzymes to break it down, what happens is that that chain, those chains of uh, carbohydrate go through your intestinal tract untouched, undigested until they get to the lower intestinal tract and sometimes you have bacteria that digest them there. And that's what dietary fiber is. You know, they used to throw dietary fiber away. They used to feed it to the pigs. What good is it? It doesn't supply any calories. What possible use could it be? Of course, when they started throwing it away, people got fatter because the food was more concentrated in calories. They got constipated because they didn't have anything to make bowel function. They had higher risks of cancer, higher cholesterol levels. That dietary fiber is very important. It's supposed to remain in your intestinal tract intact. Now if you look at the connections between starch sugars and dietary fiber sugars, and you look carefully, they are portrayed in these drawings as being different. They are different connections. Same sugars, same source, which is plants. Now let's talk about other molecules of life. Let's talk about proteins for a minute. Proteins, you hear terms related to proteins such as essential amino acids. 
You hear about non-essential amino acids. Well, the difference between essential and non-essential is that essential you have to get from your food. It's essential. It's in your diet. It has to be in your food. Non-essential you can make. So you can take the basic material that goes to form protein or amino acids and you can make those amino acids that are non-essential. Now there are 20 amino acids that go to form all the proteins in nature. See how simple nature is? 20 different amino acids. And they go to form all the proteins in nature. They go to form all the proteins in mosquitoes, all the proteins in elm trees and whales and people, all the proteins. They do it by rearranging in different sequence. Just like you take, you make all the words in a dictionary by rearranging 26 letters. That's the way it works. Now there are some kinds of amino acids that we're going to talk about that are sulfur containing amino acids. Let's take a look at some of these. If you look at our molecule drawing here, you see your favorite familiar hydrogens there in gray. You see your oxygen in red and your carbon in green. But we've got something new here. We've got a nitrogen. In this case, two nitrogens. That's one of the characteristics of an amino acid or protein that contains nitrogen. Now why would you want to know this? Well, one of the things you may have noticed on your blood test when you get a blood test back is you have a, a value there. It's almost all the routine blood tests. It's called BUN. That's blood urea nitrogen. And that reflects the amount of nitrogen that you eat. In other words, how much protein you eat. And it reflects the ability of the body to get rid of that nitrogen through the liver and the kidneys. And that nitrogen all comes from these sources, those amino acids which form proteins. There are 20 amino acids. Human beings can make 12 of those amino acids, but we can't make eight. And so those are the eight essential amino acids. This particular chart here is looking at a typical chart that is found in a dietetic handbook. It lists the minimum requirement for amino acids, the essential ones. It lists the recommended requirement for essential amino acids. And then it lists what single plant foods provide. And the interesting thing for you to understand is that plant foods are important because a lot of people have this misinformation. They think plants don't supply all your essential amino acids or all your proteins. But if you look at the basic science, what you find is that plant foods, single foods like rice or potatoes or corn or beans or sweet potatoes, those single sources of protein supply all the essential amino acids necessary to provide for growth and for life for not only adults but also children. Of course, the non-essential amino acids that we can make ourselves. Now, some amino acids, there are two of them actually, some of those 22, contain an extra substance. You see our full familiar hydrogen in gray, oxygen in red, carbon in green, nitrogen, it's in blue, but we've got another kind of atom here and that is we have a yellow sulfur. Now, why would you want to know about sulfur containing amino acids? You say to me, why are you bothering me with this kind of stuff? Because it's very important you learn about sulfur containing amino acids. Methionine is a sulfur containing amino acid and so is cysteine a sulfur containing amino acids and the other 18 amino acids do not contain sulfur. Well, sulfur containing amino acids are very important to you and you want to be able to identify them and most importantly the source of those sulfur containing amino acids. Now when you take, you put amino acids together in long chains, what we call that is we call that a protein. That's how you make proteins. Again, by taking and mixing and matching them in different sequence, you build all the proteins in nature with the same 20 amino acids. Now, why do you want to know about sulfur containing amino acids? Well, sulfur containing amino acids, they are metabolized into sulfuric acid. And as you're going to learn, sulfuric acid and other kinds of acids in foods have to be dealt with. When you dump acid in your body, which you do when you pick foods that have lots of sulfur containing amino acids, what happens is your body has to neutralize that acid. And the primarily, primary neutralizing substance in your body comes from the bones. And so the bones dissolve. And so that's how you lose your bones, is by taking in a lot of acid. So you want to know where those sulfur containing amino acids are. You want to know what foods contain sulfur containing amino acids because they break down into sulfuric acid, a very powerful acid, so that you can keep your bones strong throughout life. And by the way, those bones, when they break down, they solidify in the kidney system and form calcium-based kidney stones that look like little bones. Sulfur containing amino acids are metabolized into homocysteine. Homocysteine has been identified as a new risk factor for heart attacks, for strokes, for diabetes, for osteoporosis, for blood clots in your veins. You hear about this all the time. People say, oh, you've got to be worried about homocysteine. Don't just get a cholesterol test. 
That's not enough. You've got to check your homocysteine level. And if your homocysteine level is high, you've got to take folic acid. Well, wouldn't it be better to know where that homocysteine comes from? It comes from the sulfur containing amino acids, in this case, particularly methionine. Sulfur feeds cancerous tumors. If you take and grow a tumor in an isolated system and you deprive it from methionine, you take methionine out of the system, you don't give it any of that amino acid, it can't grow. So if I wanted to prevent cancer, if I had, if I had cancer, I'd certainly want to know about sulfur-containing amino acids and especially where they come from. They're toxic to intestinal tissues. In fact, they're involved in the development of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. They form toxic reactions to your bowel. Also in experiments done on various kind of animals, what they find is that when you restrict the sulfur-containing amino acids, the animals live longer. And maybe that could be translated to your life and my life. And remember rotten eggs? What are you smelling with rotten eggs? Sulfur, right? So think about it. What happens when you eat all that sulfur? You smell like rotten eggs. That's right. You don't want to smell that way. So you want to know a lot about those sulfur convenient amino acids, where they come from, and I'm going to give you the answer right now. Sulfur containing amino acids are primarily found in animal products. Take a look at this. For the same number of calories, beef has four times more sulfur containing amino acid, particularly methionine, than does pinto beans. And by the way, they have the same amount of protein. Eggs four times more than corn, cheddar cheese five times more than white potatoes, chicken provides seven times more methionine than does rice, and tuna 12 times more methionine than sweet potatoes. So say you decide that you want to lower your risk of heart disease, you don't want to get osteoporosis, you want to slow the development of cancer, you want to smell good, you want to make those bowels happy, you don't want to fill them full of toxins, what are you going to do? You're going to pick foods that are low in those sulfur containing amino acids which if you want to make it a general simple thing to understand, basically you're going to choose plant foods and avoid the animal products. All right, how about other molecules of life that you hear about all the time, the fats? You really want to know about these, I know you do. There are good fats and there are bad fats. There are essential fats, there are omega-3 fats, there are omega-6 fats, there are triglycerides and there are hydrogenated fats and boy, you hear about these all day long. Go to the supermarket, you read them on labels. People are advertising these things to you in various kinds of products. Don't eat this kind of fat, eat this kind of fat. You really want to know about these kinds of fat. You really need a good lesson in biochemistry. So let's talk about these fats. I want to introduce a carbon to you, and this happens to be methane. It's the simplest of all carbons. It's a single carbon atom that's attached with four arms to four hydrogens. You can see that. So now you know that carbon has four arms. And carbon loves to have its arms filled. It doesn't like to have any empty arms. So in this case, it's very happy because it's got all arms filled with a hydrogen. If we take and we put carbons together in chains, what we find is we have something called a fatty acid. And if you'll notice there that each one of those carbons is very happy because it has each one of its arms attached. In the first carbon, you see that it is attached to three hydrogens and the fourth arm is attached to the next carbon. The next carbon has two arms attached to the adjacent carbons and two arms attached to the hydrogens. So this kind of chain, this chain of multiple carbons is called a saturated fat. All of its arms are filled. They're all saturated. It's a saturated fat. Look, it's a nice straight line too. It's all put together in without any curves, very straight. Now the way we number chains of carbon, which we call fatty acids, the way we number them is very simple. We start at the beginning and call that carbon number one. Then we go on to the next carbon, we call that two, and then the next one three, and the next one four, and five, and so on. Now the reason you want to know this is because this is how you get the terms such as omega-6 and omega-3 fats. The omega and they start with in numbering, and that's how they designate the fat. Now sometimes, sometimes what happens is the carbons are not fully saturated. They don't have all their arms attached. I want you to look at the number nine position here. And I want you to notice that the carbon at position number nine and the carbon at position number ten, they only have three arms attached. They're attached in this case to two carbons and one hydrogen. There's one arm just flailing out there in the breeze, just as unhappy as can be by the way. This is called an unsaturated fat because it's not fully saturated with hydrogens. 
The next carbon open, carbon number 10, it also has one arm free. It's just failing out there in the breeze. Well, what happens is those two free arms, they get together and they form what we call a double bond. In this case, we have the double bond at the number 9 position. This is a monounsaturated fat. We have one place in this whole chain of fat that's unsaturated. It's called monounsaturated, and it's also called oleic acid, and it's also known as olive oil. That's what olive oil is. But look at olive oil. It's bent. It has a bent chain there. There's a reason you want to know about this and the fact that it has a bent chain. Here is a polyunsaturated fat. We have two areas where we have unsaturation. We have it at carbon number six. Carbon number six and seven only have three things attached to it. And so we also have it at carbon number nine. So we have two unsaturated bonds. We're called two double bonds because it's more than one. We call it poly. So that's polyunsaturated fat. You've heard about polyunsaturated fats. Those are like vegetable fats. Vegetable oils are called polyunsaturated. Now you know what that means. You've also heard about good fats. You need to get your good fats. You need to get your fish oils. You need to get your flaxseed oil. You need to get your omega-3 fats. Well, omega-3 fats, the double bond occurs at the third position. There's another kind of essential fat too, and that's called an omega-6 fat. And the double bond occurs at the sixth position. That's how you get the designation omega-3s and omega-6s. These are polyunsaturated fats. They are also bent. I want you to notice that they are bent. Now there's something very, very important that I'm going to tell you right now. And that is that only plants can desaturate at the 3 and 6 position. So in other words, it's only plants that can make omega-3 and omega-6 fats. These are called essential fats. Why they're essential? They have to be from your food. So that means it's essential that you eat plants. You say, oh no, how about fish? Fish have omega-3 fats. I've been told, eat fish oil, I get lots of omega-3 fats. That's true, but the fish didn't make the omega-3 fat. No, the fish ate the algae and the algae made the omega-3 fat. So why not go to the original source? No animal, including people, can make a bond, a double bond at the three or the six position. And notice again that these are bent. Now if you take a whole bunch of chains of fully saturated fats and you line them up together, notice how tightly they fit together. Because they fit tight together, they can form a solid structure. And so when you have saturated fats, you have a solid food like butter. I mean think about it, butter is solid at room temperature. And the reason it's solid is because you have these long straight chains because all the carbons are fully saturated. One of the hardest structures and one of the famous structure, most favorite structures for women in particular is a carbon structure that's very, very tightly pushed together. As a matter of fact, through years of heat and pressure, those carbons that were originally wide apart, those chains of carbons got put together very, very tightly and they formed a diamond. Now what happens when you have bent chains of fat? Like fats that are monounsaturated like olive oil or bent chains of fat like omega-6s that are common in corn oil or omega-3s that are common in flaxseed oil or fish oil. What happens when you're dealing with a whole bunch of bent chains? Those bent chains, they can't fit together tightly, can they? So what is the food at room temperature? It's a liquid. So that is a, a liquid at room temperature. That's why it's called an oil as opposed to generally termed a fat because they are bent and don't fit tightly together. Now, it's hard to take and spread oil on your on your bread, right? Yeah, that doesn't sell well. Or, uh, you know, to, uh, to have oil, pour, pour a couple tablespoons of olive oil on your baked potato, that's not very appealing. So wouldn't it be nice if you could take all those bent chains and you could straighten them out and you could make a food out of it? And if you could do it cheaply, that'd be really great. Well, that actually happened in a real life situation and that happened during World War II when butter became rare in Europe and also the United States. They they ran out of butter and they wanted to have a butter-like substance and so what they did is they took vegetable oils like corn oil and straightened out the chains and added yellow dye and then added some flavorings and they made margarines and made something very inexpensive that looked and tasted like butter. And they did that by saturating these chains of polyunsaturated fat, the vegetable oils. Now let's take a look at how they did that. If you take a bent chain 
and you take and bombard it with hydrogen. And if you look on the package, when you take and you buy something in the supermarket, it says hydrogenated fat. Well, what they say there, what they mean there is they, in the manufacturing process, they took hydrogen in the laboratory, they took and bombarded your oil with hydrogen and straightened out the, the chains of fat so they could now be solid and that's how they formed your shortenings or your margarines. That's how they made it. Well, that would be well and good except for there's a problem here. When they bombard that double bond with hydrogen, many times what they do is they add two hydrogens to the double bond and so you have a fully saturated long chain. But the other way that they can make that chain straight is not by adding two hydrogens to it, but by knocking one of the hydrogens 180 degrees around. Naturally on a double bond, if you look there on the top when you see the cis there, naturally what you find is the two hydrogens are on the same side of the bond. Cis means same. So that means you have a cis fat. When you take and add hydrogen, what you can do instead of just adding two hydrogens to that double bond and breaking the double bond, is you can actually take and knock one of those hydrogens to the opposite side. Now you have the two hydrogens existing on the opposite sides of the double bond, so you now have a trans fat. So that's how you get trans fatty acids. That's those dangerous fats that you read about all the time that manufacturers put in your food, which by the way, they're going to eliminate or be properly labeled on all foods by January of 2006. About 60,000 people they estimate will die in the time they decided they should label the foods properly and when the law goes into effect in January of 2006, about 60,000 people will die of heart disease. But it will eventually happen. Trans fatty acids or trans fats are toxic to the system. They're unnatural. In other words, they don't occur in nature except under one circumstance I'm going to tell you about. If they are in your food, it's because a manufacturer made them. And so they don't fit into systems that were designed to work with cis fats. Like, for example, your cell membranes are designed to incorporate cis fats. When you incorporate a trans fat, sometimes you leave big holes in the cell membrane. So now cancer-causing substances can get in and affect your nucleus and, and damage the inside of your cell and promote cancer. They don't work with the cholesterol metabolizing systems properly. And as a result, they raise your cholesterol and your triglycerides and they increase artery damage because they're unnatural, because our systems are not designed to work with them. Let me tell you the exception. In, in animals with a rumen, rumen animals like cows, they will make in their rumen, they will make trans fats. But that's one of the rare circumstances where trans fats occur in nature. Otherwise, they're just manufactured fats. These are things you really want to stay away from. The one important thing that all of you really want to know about fat is what happens to it after I eat it? Well, what happens to fat after you eat it is effortlessly moved from your fork and spoon to your body fat. As a matter of fact, it really takes just a few calories from your food to make this process happen. It moves from the fork and spoon to your body fat and is stuck in your fat tissues with a cost of only 3% of the calories in the food. It does it so effortlessly that it doesn't even change the chemical structure of the fat. So that if I come up to you and I biopsy you, I take a needle, stick it in your buttocks, thigh, or abdomen, I suck the fat out, I take it to the laboratory and analyze it, I can tell what kind of fat you eat. If you happen to eat a lot of trans fats, like margarines and shortenings, your body fat will be full of trans fats. And I can see them right in the chemical analysis. You eat a lot of olive oil, I'll see a lot of monounsaturated fat in there. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. Now keep this in mind when those of you who think to yourselves, well, it's not going to make a lot of difference if I just put a little bit of Pam on this pan. What could be the difference? Just a little Pam. Well, that little bit of Pam is going to go right into your body fat and be stored. Oh, a couple tablespoons of olive oil is not going to make any difference. You've heard the, the expression from my lips to my hip. Well, that's what's going to happen to it. You see, that fat in your food has a very important purpose. That is the metabolic dollar that the body saves for the day when no food is available. But folks, that day never comes. <laughs> and because fat is in the same chemical structure as the fat that you put in your body tissues, it's done effortlessly. There's a special kind of fat that you can find in our food. There's a C15 and C17 fat, which is a special kind of fat, which means that the double bond is at the 15 and the 17 position. That C15 and that C17 fat is characteristic of dairy products. So I can take and biopsy your fatty tissues and I can tell how many cheese sandwiches 
and ice cream cones and gallons of milk that you have to drink based upon how filled your fatty tissues are with this particular kind of fat. It's a real reflection as to how unhealthy your diet is. You will hear people say all the time that particularly some of the gurus that are preaching diet books, particularly those of you, those who are teaching low carbohydrate diets, they'll tell you the worst thing in your diet is carbohydrate. Don't eat carbohydrate. Go on my low carbohydrate diet, like the Atkins diet or Protein Power, those kinds of diets. There are similar ones like Sugar Busters, the South Beach diet. Get those carbohydrates out. Carbohydrates is the problem, they tell you. All you have to do is get the carbohydrates out. Why? Well, it's obvious because carbohydrate turns to sugar, which turns to fat. You say, well, seems logical to me. That's probably what happens. And then you step back for a minute and you say to yourself, well, let's see, carbohydrates are so bad. If I look around the world, now they tell me not to eat rice, don't eat potatoes. If I look around the world and I see various populations of people and I look at what they eat, what do I see? I see people who live on high rice diets are always thin and they're always young looking and they're very active and they don't have the diseases that are common to people in this country. I think there's a problem here. I think there's a disconnect in the message. Now when you get involved in the science, you just see how silly that is. And every scientist knows this. Every research paper says this, without exception. And that it is, it is not easy to turn sugar into fat. In fact, it does not occur in human beings under ordinary circumstances. We don't have mechanisms to convert carbohydrate, whether it be from rice or even white sugar, except for the fructose. The fructose does it easily, as I told you before. We don't have mechanisms to convert the kinds of sugars that are present in potatoes and rice and so on into fat easily. And it doesn't occur under usual circumstances. The process is called de novo lipogenesis, or the new production of fat. And all scientific papers says this does not occur under usual circumstances in human beings. Now, it occurs in cows and pigs. They have good mechanisms for this, but not people. If you look at the chemical structure of sugar, you see that it is a ring structure. And what it occurs is that to take and change this ring structure and to break it apart and flatten it out and elongate it, what you have in order to make a chain of fat is you have a very difficult, expensive process to occur. In fact, the calculation is it takes 30% of your calories, which is very inefficient to do this. So people just basically don't do it. One time I calculated, now it can occur, it can occur, you could do it if you set up an experimental situation where you put people in a laboratory, you feed them lots and lots of simple sugars and refined flours and you don't exercise them. In my case, when I calculated it out, I had to eat more than 5,000 calories a day before my body resorted to de novo lipogenesis, which is an unnatural situation. So when people tell you don't eat carbohydrates, it turns to fat. Not only is it illogical from what you observe worldwide, if they understood the biochemistry, they'd know how just silly that is. Interesting experiment done by a listener in 1987. One that really takes and summarizes the whole point about fat and its importance in your diet and really how to make yourself thin. Listener took a group of people and he designed a diet where the people couldn't tell what was in the food. He made muffins, and he made stews and all kinds of different meals for breakfast, lunch, and dinner that they basically all looked the same and he was able to disguise fat in the food. He was able to put it in without the person's knowing what they were eating. And then he took and he asked the people in these experiments as they said, we want you to eat as much as you want, ad libitum they call it. Eat as much as you want to your heart's content. Fully satisfy your appetite. And what he did is he fed them foods that looked the same now, that were high in fat, they were 45 to 50 percent fat and then he changed it to a medium fat and then he changed it to a low fat intake, just took the fat out of these same muffins, these same stews, tasted the same, looked the same, told them to eat as much as they wanted. And the result was is that as a group these individuals took in 600 less calories when they made low fat foods. Let that be a lesson to you on how to succeed as far as your permanent weight loss is concerned. Make your foods delicious. Make them so you can eat as much as you want of them, but make them also low in fat because the fat you eat is the fat you wear. 
When you go to the store, you'll find advertised on packages statements such as fat free. And you'll look at the ingredient label and you'll say such things as monoglycerides, diglycerides. Say, I have no idea what that is. What's monoglycerides? What's diglycerides? Nothing I recognize. And then do you say to yourself, well, wait a minute. Now, I got a blood test recently and it said triglyceride on that. Maybe that's something similar. And I know triglycerides are fats. When they take your blood test and they take the tube and they sit it on the counter, what happens is in a few minutes, a layer of fat forms on top, just like if you take chicken soup and put it in the refrigerator, a layer of fat forms on top. In fact, some of my patients have such high triglycerides before the, the blood drawer takes the needle out of their arm, it's already started to separate between fat and red blood cells. And they have really high triglycerides. So you might get a clue that there's something going on here with these glycerides. And there's some association between mono and dye and triglycerides. And you'll want to know about this. So let's talk about these. Fats don't run all around in the body or even in foods in just the chains of fatty acids. They instead, they connect themselves to a backbone. And that backbone, which is represented in a purple color here, is called glycerol. It's a three carbon backbone. Glycerol is its name. If you have one chain of fatty acid, and it's the fatty acids that are stored in the fat cells, by the way. If you have one chain of fatty acid to attach to the glycerol, you have a monoglyceride. If they attach two chains to it, you have a diglyceride, and three chains, you have triglycerides. So when you pick up a package and it says fat-free, what are they saying? They're saying that per serving, a serving could be very tiny, there's less than a half a gram of fat. That's all they're saying. I mean, it could be pure oil, it could be fat-free if it was less than a half a gram of fat. What you want to do is you want to look at the label, see what the ingredients are. And if you see these products in there, these monoglycerides, these diglycerides, remember, the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And those mono and diglycerides are very easily stored in your body. Another substance that you commonly hear about is cholesterol. And I want you to notice that cholesterol looks completely different than chains of fat. But people often think, well, cholesterol and triglycerides are the same, or cholesterol and fat's the same. They often get them confused and mixed up. And the reason is, is because high fat foods, which are animal products usually, are generally high cholesterol foods. And of course, cholesterol only occurs in animal products. They also get them mixed up because when people eat the rich American diet, it protests by raising many signs that you're in trouble, like the blood pressure goes up, or the blood sugar goes up, or the cholesterol goes up, or the triglycerides go up. Well, commonly, when you eat a rich diet and you're not healthy, triglycerides and cholesterol will be up on your blood test. And so you get confused and say, well, maybe they're the same thing. But I'll have to tell you, there are many people I see who have low cholesterol, high triglycerides, and vice versa. they are different substances. They just commonly go up together when people eat a rich diet. And the primary source of the cholesterol is eating animal foods. And the triglycerides go up when you eat lots of fat and also lots of simple sugars. Cholesterol is a molecule that contains four ring structures. It's very stable. It goes on to make various hormones in the body. It makes vitamin D in the body. It's an important substance, but you make all you need. It is not a nutrient. You do not have to eat any. Your body efficiently makes all the cholesterol you need from various plant sterols. Vitamins are organic compounds. They're called vitamins or vital because you can't make them. They have to come from your food. So they're tiny little organic substances that must come from your food. Note that of the 13 known vitamins, 11 are made by plants. You think maybe there's some kind of conspiracy going on here? 11 of the 13 vitamins are made by plants. The two that aren't are vitamin D, which is really not a vitamin, it's a hormone. Hormones are small organic substances made by the body. Vitamin D is made by the body when you put sunlight on the skin. It's really not a vitamin under usual circumstances. And the other vitamin is B12, which is made by bacteria, is vitamin B12. Now, in our society, we have vitamania. Many of your friends and relatives, and maybe some of you, have medicine cabinets full, shelves in your kitchen full of vitamin pills that you're taking to become healthier. That is not a good thing to do. Now, I don't make myself popular by having this kind of discussion with you, I have to say. People don't want to hear that the vitamins that they believe in may not be in their best interest. 
Industry doesn't like to hear about it either. This is a huge, huge, multi, multi-billion dollar industry. It's a quick fix, people think. And so when you talk against vitamins, people don't hear that message very well. As a matter of fact, I did a radio show one time. I've had many radio shows over tw the last 20 years. And I had a uh, syndicated radio show all over the West Coast. On that show, I'd present information about vitamins. I'd present some positive things about vitamins, and I'd present some negative things about vitamins. I'd say things like, well, if you're going to take vitamin A, you increase your risk of having a deformed baby by up to 1 in 57 times. I think people should know that. A pregnant woman who takes vitamin A could get into serious trouble as far as a malformation of her baby. I think they should know that. And there are other negative effects of the vitamin tablets. Homocysteine, for example, I would tell you these days, if you take pills to lower homocysteine, such as folic acid and B12 and other B vitamins, if you take these pills, they show that if you have had heart surgery called stents and you take these pills to lower homocysteine, it ends up closing the arteries more rapidly. You should know that. So I would discuss these kinds of things on my show, as well as the positive, I would talk about the negative. Well, there was a group of people in Los Angeles who used to record my radio show. And then busily after the show, they would take and edit out all the negative statements I made about vitamins. And my sponsors for the radio show were often the vitamin companies and natural food stores which make their money selling vitamins. So every morning on the answering machine of the natural food stores who supported my radio show was this edited clip of Dr. McDougal condemning, condemning vitamins. Yeah, it got me in a lot of trouble. I lost a lot of my sponsors that way, but I still am not going to change what I believe. And that is that you should not be getting your vitamins from pills, you should be getting them from plants. Now, why do I say that? Well, for three reasons. One is, is that I don't really find a lot of good coming from people taking vitamins. I'll ask you, how many of you know people who've lost 100 pounds taking vitamins? How many of you know people who have stopped their chest pain taking vitamins, who have gotten off all of their insulin and other diabetic pills, type 2 diabetics taking vitamins, gotten rid of their arthritis by taking vitamins? To date, I've not seen people raise their hand and say they see this. But I want to tell you every day, and I don't exaggerate, every day I get an email, I get a personal conversation of somebody who has accomplished exactly that by changing the food they eat, which is basically cost free, and going for a walk every day. So why should I bother with something that has such little effect, little benefit, and quite honestly little harm from taking these pills? There's no bang for the buck. And I'm really into a big bang for the buck when it comes to the kind of advice that I like to get people and the return I like to see. The other thing to think about is what do people in our society suffer from? Think about your friends for a minute, your relatives. Do they have deficiency diseases? Do you have friends with scurvy? Beriberi, pellagra, essential fatty acid deficiency, amino acid deficiency, things that supplements might take care of. If you look in this direction, I doubt that you see any of these problems. But take and switch your vision 180 degrees. Look over here. Look in terms of excess. Do you have any friends or family who have problems of excess? Excess fat, excess salt, excess calories, excess protein, excess contamination. The problem is here. You don't treat problems of excess by giving solutions for deficiencies. It doesn't work. The, the last thing is it happens to do with uh, respect. Okay? It has to do with, uh, with respect for people and or nature. You see, if you... Uh, if you say that these vitamin pills are really great, really important, and really an improvement on nature, then what you're saying is there's somebody, some man or woman sitting in a laboratory in a factory someplace that's smarter than God, or your creator, or nature, or whatever you want to say. In other words, they're doing a better job of improving the original product over what nature did originally. I mean, vitamins are absolutely essential in your diet. So are minerals. But they need to come in the natural packages. When they don't, you get into trouble. And you might think, well, how could that be? How could it be just me taking this, this uh, 1,000 milligram vitamin C capsule will cause me a problem, or this beta carotene capsule, this vitamin E capsule, this uh, vitamin A capsule? How could it cause me any problems? Well, let me explain one way that it might cause you problems. There were some experiments done 
on uh, treating patients to prevent cancer. It made sense to, 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 to use vitamins to prevent cancer because after all they found that people who, for example, had high levels of beta carotene in their blood or who ate a diet high in beta carotene, they had a very low risk of cancer, in particular lung cancer. So they said, well, instead of having people change their diet, why don't we just raise the levels of beta carotene in the blood by giving them pills? Let's give them beta carotene pills. So two major studies were done and they picked people likely to get cancer, they took smokers. And they gave them beta carotene capsules, supplements, and they followed them along and they found that they had a 17% increased risk of getting lung cancer compared to those who got the placebo. You said, how could that be? Well, if you understand how these carotenoids, the beta carotene, which is one of the carotenoids work, it's simple to understand. In the cell is a receptor, kind of like a, a little stool that the, the uh, carotenoid sits on to do its job. There's a receptor, it's called a carotenoid receptor and that's where all the carotenoids work. And there are 300 or more different carotenoids in nature in plant foods. And they all have to sit on that same little receptor, that same little stool to do their job. When you flood the system with one carotenoid, in this case beta carotene, the other carotenoids can't get in there to do their work. So you create an imbalance. So when you take these high doses of supplements, you're creating imbalances which create problems. And that's why you see these negative impacts of taking supplements when you expect that it would be all positive. It's such a simple way to solve your problems. You can eat your bacon and eggs and take a vitamin pill. Everything will be fine. Cannot be that way. It has to be in their natural packages. So when you take the vitamins and minerals in their natural packages, you take them properly balanced with enough vitamin A to match the B, to match the C, to match the dietary fiber, the phytase, the other phytochemicals. So they're all in this beautifully designed package. So when it goes in the body, it floods your system with all the necessary ingredients to take and make the system work properly. If you take an isolated ingredient that's been taken out and concentrated and sold to you as a supplement, you create imbalances. Now I do use some of these supplements, I have to say to you. I use them as pills. I will sometimes use iron, for example, to treat somebody with anemia after I've dealt with the causes. I will sometimes give vitamin C. Maybe that decreases the duration of a cold. I have to admit to you, don't tell anybody, but I'll have to admit to you that uh, when I think I'm getting a little sniffle, I bring out my vitamin C and my echinacea, even though all the studies I read say it doesn't work. I mean, maybe this time it will. So I, I fall for that trap too. But, uh, but what you want to do is you really want to get your, your vitamins from their original sources from the plant foods. Best spent money, most effective way to deal with these problems. And the scientific research clearly says that's the way. Same thing with minerals. All the minerals, the essential minerals you have, they come to you through plants. They're originally found in the ground, they're like little rocks, like iron, manganese, copper, calcium, sodium. They're in the ground. They dissolve in watery solutions. The watery solutions are picked up by the roots of plants. They're incorporated in the roots, stems, leaves, flowers, and fruits of plants, and then, then animals come and eat the plants. So if you want to get your most original source, because you're not going to eat ground, if you want to get your original source, most original source of minerals, go to the plants. That's where they are. And you'll reach all of your mineral needs, including your calcium need, your iron need, and so on. Things that you're sold dairy products and meat products for. Not so. They're loaded in these plant foods, these minerals are. Why is it that plants, only plants, make the essential fats, the omega-3s and the omega-6s? Why is it that plants make all the essential amino acids? They're in plants. If they happen to be in animals, it's because the animals got them from plants. They didn't make them. And your vitamins, 11 of 13, are made by plants. The other one's made by bacteria. The other one is really a hormone made by sunlight. All your minerals come to you through plants. Now, it just so happens that meat has almost no calcium and dairy has almost no iron. They're very deficient in these minerals and they won't meet your needs. Your antioxidants come from plants. All your phytochemicals come from plants. Dietary fiber is only in plants. Your essential carbohydrates are only in plants. And plants contain no cholesterol and no hydrogenated fats. The things that we've been learning about in this biochemistry lecture. So the message is a very simple one. Very cost effective, very tasty. And that is trust in your foods. They would have been designed, if you believe, through years of evolution or by divine creation to be ideal and to meet all of your needs. 
And there's no scientist, there's no doctor who's smart enough to improve upon that. The food is whole, the food is, is basic. It was designed complete before it reaches the dinner table. And so to get healthy, what you need is to recognize this simplicity, the greatness of the foods, and just consume them and save your money. And you can spend it on a McDougal Adventure vacation. <laughs> Thank you very much.